Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I wanted to talk a little bit about Reddit and how I personally think Reddit is one of the very best places to get some great advice from uh, other people about the residency. It's really tiny community, although it says, you know, there's 6,000 members uh, at any given time. There's maybe a couple hundred that are available. And if you compare it to the medical residency, which I think is like 100,000 members, it's absolutely insane. Uh, it's very different. And we, we forget that only, a, although it feels like everybody's doing a residency, only a quarter of students in a pharmacy school will, will generally do a residency. So let's look uh, first at this one, anxiety about interviews. Uh, and I won't read it to you uh, in its entirety, but uh, again, I just want to kind of comment on it, uh, make my own notes and uh, talk to you about some maybe solutions that you can have. So this one is about anxiety about the interviews. Uh, and it looks like it's Curious Anteater 4013, all right? So this was four days ago, and just talking about how how to find time to focus on the APPE you're in uh, while trying to do the CV, work on presentations, practice the scenario-based questions, study for clinical topics, research the programs thoroughly, and so forth, and talks about jumping back and forth. And some of the advice that the Redditors gave uh, is, is that same kind of juggling feeling and that really it's just practice and that you're trying to do something in a certain amount of time. So if you look at what it's going to be like and hopefully you get maybe some of your residencies that you are putting lower in the rankings as the first ones as practice, then you'll be able to you know do the very best at your residencies. But there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, dealing with what is really overwhelm from multiple sources. So as a parent, I just found out, okay, my daughter was sick, so we had to pick her up and brought her home. And then my other two daughters get out early at one o'clock. And so my day is completely changed around or, and revolves around them in many ways. And it's the same way for you guys where your life revolves around these APPEs, and then you've got these other responsibilities. So one thing that helps me, and it, it may seem kind of ridiculous, is the tomato timer. Uh, the Pomodoro method is to do 25 minutes at a time with a five-minute break, uh, or to, and you're supposed to do, if you have four of these in a row, you're supposed to take a longer break. But the idea is to actually, and this is what helps me, I actually write down, what am I working on right now? So when you look at the post, you say, okay, presentation for interviews, how many 25 minutes do I wanna put to that? Scenario-based questions, how many 25 minutes, clinical topics, research on the program, and not trying to do that switching, because if you go back to cognitive psychology, I think it's cognitive psychology, where if you switch back and forth, each time you're losing tremendous amount of time and your efficiency goes way down, so there's a, a book on this by Cal Newport. I think he's, he's still working down at Georgetown uh, as a computer scientist, computer science professor, called Deep Work, The Rules for Focus, Success in a Distracted World. It's a great book. And what he really talks about is that, you know, how do you do that deep work? And it comes to research and things like that. And the key is to build up that time, distraction-free time, uh, where you're able to do it. And just for fun, I actually went when I was in D.C., just visiting my family at the time. I was like, all right, well, let me just go to Georgetown just for fun and let me go do deep work at Georgetown. And I, I never went to meet Cal or see wherever he was. I think he's over in the nursing building or something. But I went up to the fourth floor of the library or fifth floor of the library, had a nice view of the Potomac and just went there and did some uh, undistracted work. And it was really fantastic. So one of the things he talks about is having a destination. So instead of having your normal cubby or something like that, to have a special place where you can do that deep work and, you know, putting the tomato timer on to recognize, okay, how much time am I spending on this? Or maybe you got distracted and you're no longer doing the task that you wrote down. But the tomato timer uh, and then this deep work book, I think are really great in terms of that. Uh, of course, I have the interview prep and support. Uh, really understanding the process and the point system is kind of key 
when you're talking about that and understanding, all right, well, I've got two basic kinds of questions. I've got the question where I'm going to get something where it's facts, okay, my strengths and my weaknesses, and I need to make sure to tie that back to the site. And then I've got the star questions, which are those situation, task, action, result. And getting practice in both of those questions is really key uh, to making sure that your interview answers are going to gel. Okay. Uh, let's see, the next one was uh, help with the clinical pearl. So what is a clinical pearl? Uh, what does it refer to? Can someone give me an example? Uh, disease state, uh, one of my experiences on rotations and I'm at a loss. And uh, this is from Toby Trice, okay, or Toby T. Rice. The, the top post was basically something that, you know, if, if you want to give a disease state topic, then you give key takeaways. And it's, th there are two big mistakes that happen here. One is trying to go too big. And you really have to narrow it down when you're talking only about 10 minutes because you really want to have like a minute or so for questions or maybe even a little bit longer than that. And the other thing is, you want it to relate to the site. This may sound intuitive, but most people will just do something that they already have prepared or something that they are interested in. But you want to have something that you're interested in so that you have that energy, but something also that relates to the site. So if you're going to an AmCare site, then some kind of ambulatory care uh, presentation. And to make it something that they would be interested in. So it's really, really taking, and this goes back to the rhetorical moves from your basic comp two class, but make sure you are thinking about the audience, not just the presentation, but you want to know, okay, well, I'm not just trying to do a good job with a presentation. I'm trying to connect with these people so that they're going to give me a high ranking. And usually if they like you and they feel like they would hang out with you, that would be a much higher ranking than someone who did an equal presentation, but there was no connection. Okay. And I think I, I mentioned, uh, I didn't mention this, but uh, I do have three previews at that interview, uh, residency.teachable.com forward slash P forward slash interview, uh, where I go over a podcast episode about residency interview presentation topics and tips. It's a 14 minute listen. And then a couple of sample presentations, and they're not sample presentations from an interview, but what I did was I went to ASHP a couple of years ago, and I just asked the poster presenters to do a presentation of their poster. And it, both of them were around three minutes, between three and four minutes. And you can see in their energy, in their excitement, and that they had no note cards or anything like that. They really knew the topic. From those really, really successful presentations, I think you can kind of get a gist of what it looks like to have someone that really knows their stuff. So there's the energy, the excitement, the fact that it was their own research and those types of things. And that all comes through in the three or four minutes. What you want those residents and the RPD to take away is that you are someone that is energetic and passionate about your your particular topic, and then that topic relates to them, and then that's interesting to them. So yes, you could do something you've done before, but make sure in some way it's interesting to your audience, it's relating to that program. Okay, uh, Sergeant Sluggo, let's see, pediatric, pe preceptor, pediatrics and emergency medicine. Uh, programs are required to send rejection notices during phase one. So this is kind of a little frustration with what some Redditors have, have put up about uh, not needing to uh, send uh, rejections. So yes, programs are required to let you know if they aren't going to interview you. And yes, you know, but the, the question is like, are you going to get in trouble? So this was kind of the whole problem with the masks and COVID is that, all right, well, you can tell people to wear masks, but what's the penalty for not wearing a mask? Okay, so for phase one, what is, you know, what is the penalty for not sending a rejection? Okay, so at accreditation time, some years in the future, there were complaints that some years in the past, some people didn't get rejections. Okay, 
the thing is, is that first, how many people are going to report that? And second, you know, what what is the penalty when that happens? I don't know if there is any penalty. So, yes, and, and Sergeant Sluggo does a great job of kind of addressing this. You know, all programs don't do a good job of following the rule, but they, they do have to send them. Um, there's no deadline for sending those rejections. And you as an applicant are on the wrong side of this. What I mean by that is you want them to interview you so they can go through all of their top picks and then all of the group after that until they're at the point where, okay, well, we still need a couple and then they invite you. And there's no requirement for them to say you're rejected because you literally may not be rejected until late February or early March, but you may be essentially rejected because they're probably going to invite their best candidates first. It wouldn't make sense for them to spend time with. So let's look at it this way. Let's say a program gets you know 200 applications and they want to interview 50 for eight spots. Okay, So they're going to send their top 50, those acceptances, and they're not going to send out 150 rejections. Let's say that they, they look at those, you know, that group of 50 and they really wanted to be able to rank, you know, at least 25 or let's say three times eight. So 24 of those, but they were only really to, able to rank 20 of them. The other 30 really weren't a good fit. Okay, now there's four more people that they kind of want to get. They'll send out maybe 16 invites and then that group will come in and they're still still not sending email rejections because it doesn't make sense for them to do it. Now, let's say they're done. They've interviewed 66 people. There's now 134 people that are not going to get an interview. Where do you start that process? to send 134 rejections. So my thought is that really forecasts should have a way to automate the rejection process. If they can automate the acceptance process, why can't they automate the rejection process? And what this would allow them to do is say, we have chosen these 66 people. Can you please push a button and just let all the other people know that they have not received an interview. There's no reason this can't be automated. So when you kind of think about this, this is really a process issue where the process of accepting and rejecting is is not at the point where it should be. Yes, I get how much time you put into it, but the reality is that a lot of people did not put a lot of time into the application process. When they were like trying to get to 16 applications or 20 applications, they're just throwing together an LOI, replacing the name of the hospital, sending off another application, hoping uh, that they're going to get an invitation that way. And obviously that doesn't always work out the best. So he did, men or Sergeant Sluggo did mention that um, closer to the end of phase one, they're going to collect names of programs that inform applicants of their interview status during phase one. But really what that's saying is, okay, so you've got, let's say you've got 198 people that got their rejection or acceptance and two people didn't. Those two people say, you know, this program didn't send me a rejection. All right. Well, that might have been in their spam folder. And they might have gotten a rejection. That may or may not be true. So the thing is, is that even if you do collect the names of the programs, you don't know if that didn't actually happen. You only know that a person said that they didn't get a rejection, but you don't know that a person did not get a rejection. Now, if you know, you've got a couple dozen people that say the same thing, maybe that, that has more weight and truth to it. But I think that would be incredibly difficult to do because there are 4,000 there are 4,000 places with about 2,000 to 2,500 residencies. So you're talking about an amazingly large uh, group to do that with. But I understand. I understand. And, and it's frustrating because the rejections allow you to make your next move. 
and a lack of rejection does not. And what the problem with the process is that the expectation that there will be a rejection immediately as soon as the program knows that they should be rejected um, isn't there. What would be even more helpful, but I, I think this would be really tough to do, is for sites to communicate timelines to the entire group. So what the, I mean is, okay, let's say you have 200 applicants and you say, we've invited our first 40 in. Okay. We've invited our next 40 in and are not sure if we're going to invite any more after that. We may invite another 20, but we're not sure. And what we're really just hearing over and over again is that the communication is a little bit disappointing because what they want is to know, look, just, just let me know. If, I, if I'm not accepted, just let me know that I'm not accepted. Uh, but I understand. And that's the thing is that it's going to vary. Like somebody who's got eight interviews could really care less if three programs didn't get back to them where somebody that has no interviews really cares if three interview programs didn't get back to them. So it really kind of depends. But I think this is a process issue that forecasts could really fix by allowing pharmacy residencies to have an automated rejection button uh, where they can reject all of the applicants that they didn't take action on. Let's see. Uh, and then I, I mentioned that, so people that I've talked to with a residency ghosting rate up to about 50%, and that's from the schools that are least likely to uh, match. And then I talked a little bit about academic English, but it's, it is a problem and it's one that hasn't really been addressed. And the thing is, is that everyone who got a residency, those 4,000 people are no longer going to complain because they could care less if they didn't get informed about a rejection for an interview from sites. So that leaves the other 4,000, but they're trying to get through phase two and deal with what happens with you know getting a job after 4,000 people, well, 1,500 in, won't get the interview, and then the other 2,500 who do get an interview but then never get a placement are all applying for jobs at the exact same time. Uh, this was interesting. So the, the virtual interview format, uh, kind of figuring out what the group interviews like. And uh, I've seen very many itineraries on this where you're going to have four people in the same room all talking together and you can kind of compare yourself to them. And you really do want to know exactly where they're from. That The most valuable information that you can have about another applicant is their college of pharmacy. Their college of pharmacy has a match rate, has an interview rate, has a success rate. And then you can also see how their college of pharmacy places with them. So at, at one hospital, you know, you might see only students from the deep south. So if you see another student and they're from the Midwest, you're like, what are you doing here? They don't take students from the Midwest. And of course, it's like, well, you know, they might take one. Well, maybe. But in general, the residencies are hyper uh, geographic in terms of their, you know, acceptances. And, you know, so, so coming back to the virtual interview format, uh, I've seen it where you're going to have multiple people. I've seen it where you're only going to have one person one-on-one. -on -one, and I've seen the combination where somebody might go into a half hour with the RPD, a half hour with a resident, another half hour with another resident, and then come back to the big group. And it makes for like a three hour day. But that's what I keep seeing is the long interview is about three hours. Uh, the short ones are anywhere from record two questions and two three minute videos about yourself to uh, the point where you're going to get kind of a, a 20, 25 minute uh, short interview. But uh, the virtual interview format really, really varies. Uh, but this is from Magland RX. Okay. All right. Uh, I did write a book, Phone Interview Survival Tips. It's bundled with the 100 Strong Residency Interview Questions, Answers, and Rationales. But it's like three bucks on Kindle or four on the audiobook. But you can look inside and you can just look at the table of contents. And I address intentionally in the table of contents uh, the five most common phone interview mistakes. And this is also for virtual interview mistakes. Sometimes you you can make mistakes in your decorum, in your professionalism, and 
sometimes when you're talking, it just makes absolutely no sense as you're kind of getting through what you're trying to say. So uh, just with a grain of salt, you know, you can look at those, you know, free, just kind of look at the table of contents and some of those things. And then I've got a, quite a few questions about the interview itself and then the top interview questions and uh, kind of a checklist that you need as, you, as you're going through that. Uh, but I have kind of put together uh, kind of best practices for that. Uh, this is kind of beating a dead horse, but uh, pharmacist ranked last in 2021 U.S. News and World Report best health best healthcare jobs fall outside of top 100 best jobs. I know this had already happened. I feel like I've talked about this before. I think it was 29th on the list of best healthcare jobs, and I think there were bad words down here. That's why I cut it off. Uh, but this comes from T. Gregors, uh, and so this is the thing. As students are applying to the schools, there's nothing you can do to tell them that they're not going to be successful when they graduate. It's just too far away. It's just kind of like your parents telling you not to do something. I think Jeff Foxworthy said it best. You know, let the boy pull the TV on his head. He'll learn. And that's really what happens. And yes, these people, these Redditors are trying to protect the students. It's brutal to come out with $180,000 in, in debt. It's brutal to know that there's a 20 to 30% joblessness at graduation. Those are really tough things to, to know. But let's take a deeper look at what, this, what, what the actual US News report says in terms of the pharmacy profession. And there was one little thing in there that I kind of found kind of fascinating in terms of, I think, Pharmacy's number one value proposition was that it was a flexible career, a high paying career, and one that will allow you to have a great family life. I've addressed this in my own book, uh, Finding Your Unicorn Job for Pharmacists, uh, and then, you know, financial freedom, flexible hours, and per personal fulfillment beyond the pharmacy counter. Because I personally believe there are some pharmacy jobs that are fundamentally incompatible with being a good parent and with being able to have the family life that, that would happen. So, you know, my kids could care less if I'm at the top of my license, if I'm missing their stuff on the weekends every other weekend. You know, all I would hear is, Dad, you always have to work or something like that. And I don't want that. But that was the thing. And, and when we get to this U.S. News report, you kind of, they talk a little bit about what a pharmacist is and the new salary or the new uh, data on the jobs. And the one thing that should stand out is this median salary. How is it 128000 if, I think it was this Redditor that said, you know, you're, you're now getting sixty to 90000 a year. Well, if you look at the number of pharmacists, where we would, let's just say about 300000 and you look at 15,000, which is the number of people graduating. So 15,000 over 300,000. Okay, so you're looking at 5%. So let's say that 15,000 replaced the last 5%. So 5% of that 300,000 is retired and the 5% comes in. And let's say they even come in at $60,000. What you're saying is, all right, well, that that 5% makes $60,000, but the 95% still makes 128. How much of a change would you have? And we can just do the quick math here. So 128,000, and we'll just multiply by that 95, okay? And so you get, is it billion? So million, million, uh, so 12,160,000. That seems, uh, because I'm only doing 95, okay? So 12 billion, 100, or 12 million, 160,000, okay? Got to remember that number, okay? Okay. Plus 12 million, 160,000, okay? And we're going to divide that now by 100, okay? So it only goes down to 124.6. So when you add, even if you added all 15,000 making $60,000 a year, the median income or average income would only go down, and I know median and average are two different things, would only go down to, the average income would only go down to 124,000. 
and the median may not really move much of any. So this is really misleading. And they talk about it in here, or the Redditors talk about it like, okay, well, their family and friends are making over 100000 Well, right, but you want to talk to the people that are just graduating. So let's, t let's look at a little deeper into this article. Um, and so this is the ranking, 29th in best healthcare jobs, 20 in best paying jobs. And again, what we really want is, okay, well, is it the best paying job for a new graduate? And I think that's what people are really looking at. So the salary is a nine still. This job market of an eight, I'm not sure. I'm seeing a lot of ads for vaccinators and that'll go away soon because uh, technicians are able to vaccinate and as technicians can vaccinate, we're doing whatever higher ed end jobs we're supposed to be doing. But uh, the job market is eight out of 10, but the future growth is a two, the stress is a four and the work-life balance is a four. So ultimately it gets a 5.5 on the scorecard. And so what you're seeing is as that salary goes down, as the job market goes down, future growth is already down, stress and work-life balance, I don't see those getting better, then you're going to see that the scorecard is actually going to go even lower. So the way to turn that around is to improve the future growth by having opportunities for pharmacists and then making sure to take care of these things, the stress and the work-life balance. What are the ways that the jobs that we're going to do are going to be less stressful and, and better balanced, I guess you could say. Uh, this is the, the normal curve, but what it is is a curve of those 300,000 or a sample set of the 300,000. And if you're looking at new grads and the 112 is at the 25% mark, new grads are going to be here, well, probably down here. Right. Um, how to become a pharmacist. Uh, there was one little bit of uh, antiquated information, I guess. It says most of the more than 100 PharmD programs require applicants to take the PCAT. That's no longer true. 25% uh, of schools require it. Uh, there's different, you know, it's good if you bring it or, or something like that. But, you know, with 145 programs, only 25% require that. Uh, but the rest of this was was pretty much spot on. And then you can see the jobs for vaccinators, vaccination support, uh, vaccination support, just make sure you have an active license uh, and so forth. This was the one that I was really surprised about. So upward mobility, I mean, where do you go? You can go from clinical pharmacist to director, I guess. Stress level above average, that's kind of misleading. I. So you've got above average here, so it is an above average stress level. And then flexibility is below average. So alternative working schedule and work-life balance. And maybe that's the every other weekends, the having to be part of a 24-hour institution, things like that. Um, and then they have this kind of progression to salaries and, and reviews and so forth. And this was the salary outlook. But I'm I'm not clear on if how this measures against inflation and if this is really fair to say for new grads I, I just don't know I can't can't really say anything about that okay uh, best paying cities for pharmacists interestingly Tyler Texas with a new school of pharmacy uh, has one of the highest um, and I don't know how they get this data I get the California pays high because it's a high cost of living but isn't Tyler, Texas, like in West Texas? Anyway, all right. Uh, best paying states, makes sense. California, Alaska, um, Vermont, Oregon, and Maine. Let's see. And then uh, talks a little bit about how this compares to the other uh, roles. So is it better to become a nurse uh, at 77,460 uh, versus that? And then uh, tech at 35. Uh, reviews and advice. So, um, let's see, don't look at a job you want today. Look at a position you'd be interested in 10 or 20 years. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure that people graduating with, with debt are going to want to look at a job today. Yeah, so 40% uh, work in retail or community, we kind of knew that. Uh, and then job satisfaction, they already had this already. Okay, 
Uh, whoa. Generally work 40-hour weeks, but their work can bleed into nights, weekends, and holidays. Yeah, that's for sure. And lots of multitasking. Kind of talked about how multitasking isn't such the best thing right now. And then job openings. So you're seeing vaccination support. And this is kind of the most frustrating thing is that you put pharmacist into a, a search and then you're going to get pharmacy technician um, and then you get nurse and so forth. So obviously when you're looking for a pharmacist job, that's not where you want to be. And then it's saying the salary for this vaccination support is between 90000 and 104000 And this is a, a medical recruiter. It looks like you would be going into clinics and nursing homes and things like that. So um, anyway... Uh, I think we, we kind of resolved that, and that's the same thing, just kind of going down the line. All right, so let's get back to, to kind of this beginning. So anxiety about interviews. So you know, my, my blanket advice to you is this. It really takes taking a step back, taking maybe a half hour, an hour to schedule things out and to see what's really a priority. Can you find places where, okay, well, I'm working on something in my APPE. Maybe I can make this work for my presentation for my acute care interviews. Uh, is there a way that I can do certain scenarios with my preceptor as a way to practice during my APPE? You know, can I make sure to study those clinical topics that I'm most likely to be asked, if it's AM care, if it's acute care, uh, or if I'm saying I'm going to be an ID specialist, uh, can I practice those in my APPE? So when you take a step back and you have a great conversation with your preceptor, uh, especially your APPE preceptor, uh, I think it, it is possible to find points of connection. And the key is not to make these separate things, but to really uh, make them work together.